Welcome to another segment of Tell It Like It Is. I'm your host, Morris, man, and my co-host is... Joseph Spencer. And today we're going to do another uh, sad topic. I was going through my mail today, and I got a friend in, in Chicago who regularly sends me the, the newspapers, and he sent me Sunday's Chicago Sun-Times paper. And the headline reads, Sleepover Nightmare. And what happened was, unfortunately, a, I believe she was 13. Let me just make sure here. She was 11 years old, and her name was Shamia Adams. And she was sleeping over a friend's house, having a slumber party, which is what normal young kids do. And unfortunately, some idiot was in the alley with a gun and shot into the house and shot her in the head, and she passed away shortly after. And as we talk about these topics, because we talk about this a lot, as far as what happens after these tragedies, it's the same thing. They pull out the same playbook. And what happens is there's usually a day or two afterwards, they have a, a protest in the street, you know, with the sign, stop the killing, marching through the neighborhood. And then shortly after that, the elected officials, like the mayor and the police chief, they get together and have a anti-violence summit trying to figure out how do we curve this. And as we talked about this before, it's the same playbook and they're, they're not getting any results. So you would think that they would try something different, you know. But before I go into what I think needs to be done, and you've heard some of this before, but I'm going to say it again, turn it over to Joe and get your, your thoughts on this tragedy of this young child losing her life. Well, political tears, all good. Cry over child, innocent child, but political tears don't do you no good. It just gets you votes. In certain neighborhoods, it seems like uh, even the children are not safe. If you do not value your children, and I'm not talking about just your kids, all children, to protect them, to nurture them, and, and, and to teach them something. I truly believe the idiot who did this saw a silhouette and fired through these people. I don't believe he was shooting at anybody. He just had a gun. Well, it's going to be interesting to find out because uh, I'm looking at some of the clips off the Internet as far as the, the alley and the house. And I'm like, unless you were actually shooting up in the house, right. hoping they was thinking that there's somebody in there that you're trying to kill, because I'm sure the target was not this 11-year-old child. But it's going to be interesting to find out. But here is, and I'm going to try to make this brief. Here is some of my ideas. Uh, for some reason, we live in a country that we think that if we just round up these bad guys and give them 20 to years to life, that the problem is going to be over and we can go back to our safe streets. The problem is this. When you lock up those people, here comes the next graduating class of misfits that you got to lock up too, and they're more violent than the ones you locked up. And here is some of my suggestions. We have to stop doing the same things because we're getting the same results, nothing. What we have to do is change the social structure. And what I mean by that is most of us know, and it doesn't take a genius to figure this out, the majority of the young people that are doing this, they don't have a father in the house. Their father never married mom. Mom is less than 20 years younger than them, still living with her mom. And there is no man figure in the house to kind of keep these guys in line and teach them the ways of life. Until we go back and try to fix that problem, we're going to keep getting this. It's, this is not going to stop until we stop the reason why it's happening. And again, like I said, we need to create incentive programs and educational classes to teach these young folks to say, hey, here is the path to living decent. That path here, you don't want to go down because once you get entangled in that path, you're going to be entangled in that path for the rest of your life, and you're not getting out of it. You know, you're going to end up dead or in jail. So. That's what we need to do and still are these summits that don't yield no results. You know, these educated middle class people trying to figure out what needs to be done in ghettos that they never lived in. You know, once they do their PR thing and go in front of the cameras and sit there with their bottle of water and talk about, you know, what we should do, they get up, 
in their nice suits and dresses and get in their expensive cars and go back to a middle class neighborhood where there is no crime and nobody getting shot. You know, so uh, it's just a bunch of sung and dance to me until we say, hey, let's address the issue that's causing this problem. The problem is not going to get resolved. You know, it's, it, I get sick of seeing the same stuff, you know, uh, people marching because marching ain't going to do nothing. We get you some TV time. It's not going to stop these young guys that don't have any sense from shooting people. And these summits are not going to stop crime or stop these people from killing people, you know, but it's. It's just unfortunate, you know. What are your thoughts, Joe? When I was I was brought up in the '60s, and uh, uh, there's a thing called uh, uh, censorship. I think I mentioned this before. In the '60s, when I first started learning about censorships of books and records and and information and all that, I thought it was a horrible thing. Most of my peers, white and black and Jewish, whatever race I was around at that time, thought the same thing. But I'm getting older, I'm beginning to believe there are certain types of people in all races. There's things they shouldn't listen to, they can't hear. There's a certain amount of social paths out here. Yeah. You know, there's a certain, uh, you, you got a population in a city, uh, uh, six, seven million people. You know, there's a certain amount of people in, in the population in, in different, even in upper middle class neighborhood and wealthy neighborhood, have the destructive thoughts and want to play them out. I understand that. But when you when you in a civilized neighborhood, people got families and stuff, and you get to the point that you have to put troops on the street, so you can sleep in your bed comfortably, send your your kids to 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 school comfortably, to go to church comfortably, to sit on their front. When I was a child, you could sit on the front porch and didn't have to worry about uh, getting shot. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I I don't know what the solution is, but like you said, politics. Yeah. You know, well, like I said, I think. Some of the suggestions that I have will help the problem because that's the problem. The problem is not that there's too many guns on the street. The problem is not that there's not enough police on the street. The problem is there's too many hoodlums on the street that shouldn't be there, and uh, we keep perpetuating this uh, way of life where these young people have these kids irresponsibly, and they get out of control, and then they become a problem of the city or you know or this country. That's the problem, as as opposed to. Uh, we just try to uh, round up these guys, give them 30 years to life, and we think we're going to live happily ever after. No, the next generation is coming, the next and they're going to be worse than the ones you're locking up. And then here's the other problem. You're putting a burden on, this, on the overall system when you're just incarcerating a bunch of, or detaining a bunch of people that could be either rehabilitated or they shouldn't have been raised in the structure that they have. Right. Because most of us don't realize how much money it, it costs to detain somebody for 10, 20 years. $30,000 a year. A whole lot of money. That same money could be put back into the system to create jobs, to keep these guys off the street. Because when you have a job, you, you feel a sense of importance and purpose. You know, and you, you look good. You know, every day if you got to go to work, you're going to get your hair cut every weekend. Or, you know, you're going to buy new clothes. And buying new clothes, you generate this, the, com the, 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 economy. the economy, you know. So it works. It's a good domino effect as opposed to I'm sitting at home, wasting away, waiting for a check every month. When, when I want to say again, when I was a kid, in my neighborhood, there was the barber shop. There was a shoe shop. There was a suit shop. There were stores, there were restaurants where kids could work in the neighborhood. They all feed into each other. They all feed yeah. into each other. On 45th and 47th Street, basically, there was a certain amount of people who did not have to leave the neighborhood to go and make a living. Yeah, because here's you a know? good example, and a lot of people don't think like this. When I was in high school, it was uh, now, you know, and oddly enough, when I graduated that year, it went under... Uh, I forget the term they use, but uh, the school is no longer open. You can't go outside until you leave for the day. Until you, I forget that term that they use. And but, lockdown. Yeah, it's lockdown, but it's another term. But anyway, uh, prior to that happening, before I graduated, there was a store right next to the, uh, the high school. And the, and the kids would go there on their lunch period and hang out, have burgers or whatever. Then when they closed the school and you couldn't go out for lunch, that business literally died because yeah. those kids couldn't come out and patronize the business. Right. So, you know, it feeds, everything feeds into to everything else. And it keeps when, things running smoothly. When something breaks down, it throws off everything else. When you don't have jobs in the neighborhood and kids look, listen to the music they listen to and the movies, and I can sell some kilos, I can get myself a Jag, you know. When I was a kid, I didn't know what a Jaguar was, you know. 
They didn't advertise Jaguars. We're getting off the certain subject, but I want to. They didn't ad advertise Jaguars on television because it was a wealthy person's machine. Yeah. yeah. But you know? I mean, and we're going to wrap this up because we're not going to make this long because we've touched on some of these topics before. I mean, uh, if you check some of our older uh, episodes, we talk about this as far as uh, the protesting after the, the unfortunate uh, murders. And then uh, the, the, the Fed officials uh, do a photo op where they go sit down and they talk about, you know, uh, how are we going to curve this? Because it's always the same people, the mayor, the police chief, uh, civil rights movement people, uh, advocates in the neighborhood. Reverends. Uh, church, you know, church folks and everything. And, and it's the same thing. And it's like you want to see results where when you start to do something, if there were 800 murders in your city last year, now there's 500 let you know that what you're doing is working and it's you're working. getting the numbers down. Think of that count. As opposed to uh, either the numbers are going up or the numbers are staying the same, which means what you're doing ain't working. Yeah. And again, I stress this. We need to try to work on changing the social structure because until we do, until that happens, it's going to be a whole bunch more young people getting shot in the house. You know, When you kill somebody, you kill their children and their children's children. Yeah, you kill off their bloodline. You kill off their bloodline. And it's really unfortunate when, I mean, I don't think nobody should be killed, you know, but when you got some people that you know they're going to do good things because you can see it. Right. And when these people expire at right. 17, it just is really sad because they would have went on to do good things and their offspring would have went on to do good things. Right. So unfortunately, uh, you cut off that good that uh, goodness. And that goodness. But uh, we're going to you know, wrap this one up because we kind of said what we needed to say. And as always, I thank you guys for coming to my sh talk show, Tell It Like It Is. I'm your host, Morris Man, Joseph Spencer. And my heart goes out to the family of uh, Shamir Adams, you know, for their loss. You, I can't imagine losing a child at 11 years old. But on that note, we're going to sign off. And until next time, keep thinking. Yeah. Back.